my name is Tavares Pennington. Um, I'm a senior communications and English major. Uh, that'll be important here in a second. Approaching this presentation, I shuffled through a variety of orientations from which to pursue my contribution to the research of the Slavery, Memory, and Justice Project. I knew that I was not a specialist in history, nor could I purport to have any of the academic acumen necessary of someone who says they could conduct historical research. So I decided to keep this as organic as possible. I have three arguments I would provide that seek to develop and extend the subject of my studies at this institution while joining in a conversation begun by the SMJP nearly two years ago. The first will detail the historical origin and implications of the study of slavery at universities. The second will track the themes of minimization and avoidance in relation to racial conversations on campus. And the final argument will begin to chart a path forward in continuing the conversation I will join today. So to begin. In gathering the historical origins and implications of the study of slavery at universities, we will isolate operative themes in engaging student-led historical research. To have a conversation about the history of slavery here at the place that we stand requires that you first encounter a series of tensions that will elucidate the significance of this endeavor. There is what some consider a tired history of slavery that we need not continuously retread and to others, a history of slavery that presently demands sobering confrontation. It is the conversation around reparations that was blossoming to provoke researchers at Brown University to engage its own historical relationship to slavery. Perhaps this coincides with the haunting realization from Black Americans that the government may never truly rectify its violent habits. That is because in 2002, following the failure of civil appeals made to the government for reparations, there is an increase in lawsuits against private organizations shown to be engaged in the sale of humans. At this point, universities were not thought to be outside the domain of criticism for this history. This instance, which has in many ways persisted throughout the last 20 years of discussing the relevance of rectification and reparations, reached another crescendo in 2014 with the publishing of ta Coates's The Case for Reparations. In that article published in The Atlantic, Coates details the history of housing policy and the continued disenfranchisement of Black Americans amidst a backdrop of successful reconstruction in Jim Crow America. In the same way physical impoverishment of Black life have been instituted in this country, so too have social and psychological impoverishments been instituted. A glaring example of this is, of course, the absence of Black history within white contexts, our reason for being here today. Amidst the variety of projects that have been deployed to address the absence also come a variety of strategies to situate institutional engagement alongside a desire to conjure the truth, however ugly it may be. In the case of the Pen and Slavery Project, we see a student-centered investigation that serves as an example of students working cohesively as an independent organization within a schema of larger institutional histories. This is a group that uniquely reserves the right to critique as well as stage the reconciliatory process of recovering a history of slavery. This is no endowment from the university. This is a claim made by students to the university, demanding the truth in response to inaccuracies published by the college. There is credit due to groups that consider a university's endowment a, a tainted fund, a source of sustainment that feeds on itself, revealing the core institutional obligation to stakeholders, not students. Um, the uh, sense of astonishment, if uh, you read some of the student reports about the project, they elicit a probably familiar sense of astonishment at learning of the history of slavery at the institution you attend. This causes questions and very few answers. This common thread is perhaps why Brown University did not set out to resolve the issue, but rather to provide factual information and critical perspectives to enrich discussion of the issue on our campus and in the nation as a whole. These projects, when done in the best fashion, are not further drivers of division, but rather projects offering moments where we suspend judgments and try to painfully embrace a history founded in violence and violation. This, I have determined, is also the task of my investigation. Now to the second argument. The themes of minimization and avoidance contribute to a muddled history of racial conversations on campus. It has been noted that while many white students and faculty more interested in leading anti-racist uh, anti and inclusion work often express confusion and powerlessness. By detailing a recent history of diversity, equity, and, in 
inclusion work on campus. We will engage the facets of DEI work at Jewel that impact the perception of racial issues. As a member of the Hilltop Monitor, I and another student set out to write an institutional review of diversity and inclusion work at Jewel. The first half was published in September of 2019. The second half was unfortunately never published. That article was 13 pages of detail covering the dense recent history of diversity and inclusion work, mostly from 2015 and on. That is because prior to 2015, it was a murky history at best of efforts to increase diversity at Duke. One of our conclusions was that the main issue is twofold. There is a concern both with Jules' complacency in preventing bias incidents from happening on campus and its public response to such issues. Students, student and staff interviews confirmed a culture of hesitance when it came to speaking candidly about the way they felt the institution handled its DEI initiatives. Our reporting it, uh, noted multiple instances of leadership changes, people stepping down, and new appointments to new groups created to shore up specific concerns. A former employee interview stated, I actually tried to quit the staff diversity group at least two or three times because what I was thinking was very different from everyone else on campus, and I was getting frustrated because I didn't think we were doing enough. For me, getting together two to three times a year for an hour wasn't doing much for us. As it stands, Surface level engagements seem a pattern that has mired the work of DEI initiatives at Jewel. To give a brief review of the former structure of DEI work at Jewel, in 2016, Jewel forms the Diversity Education Work Groups, or DUES, at the staff, student, and faculty levels. Developments do come out of these groups, such as the Multicultural Student Room and CTI 150. The overarching DUE was called the Bias Incident Response Team, or BERT. This group was the result of the steering committees established and intended to address how the institution deals with the presence of bias incidents on campus. And while the BERT would soon morph into the climate assessment and response team, there's little more clarity about how the precise way the institution engaged incidents of bias impact our campus culture. The climate assessment and response team charter reads the following. The Climate Assessment and Response Team is a group of key college personnel and selected students who, in coordination with and in assistance to the anti-harassment coordinator, identify systematic concerns with campus climate and concerns that may arise from particular trends and then collaborate with the anti-harassment coordinator to implement proactive steps intended to promote a campus climate that is welcoming and safe for all students. Despite the noble quest that Jewel has been on to determine a clear path toward a comprehensive DEI work plan, the road has been tumultuous in tracking institutional progress on matching intention with results. And perhaps it's here that we infuse a theoretical point Tanahasi Coates provides in his text between the world and me. It does not matter the institutions of individual educators were noble. Forget about intention. What any institution or its agents intend for you is secondary. A great number of educators spoke of personal responsibility in a country authored and sustained by criminal irresponsibility. The point of this language of intention and personal responsibility is broad exoneration. Mistakes were made, bodies were broken, people were enslaved. We meant well, we tried our best. Good intention is a hall pass through history, a sleeping pill that ensures the dream. As Coates implies, perhaps we should seek to move closer to inspect the violence that even those institutions that seem distinct from apparatuses of physical violence can support and enliven. The intercultural development inventory that Jewel has used as one of its primary tools in extending the DEI initiatives is focused on dealing with the dangers of how our community encounters and deals with difference. Many here are familiar with this measure, though many are also not. Although I do not have the most recent statistics for the IDI, the results reported in 2019 for our campus community were as follows. The possible results for the IDI are denial, polarization, minimization, acceptance, and adaptation. Of the approximately 200 faculty and staff who took the exam, almost 50% scored in the minimization range, with only 15% scoring acceptance, and the rest largely in denial or polarization. Now, we should take a note that we are talking about a trend of a certain kind of violence. That is the violence of minimization of instances of difference that are present on campus and in the classroom. This is a particular orientation that is in line with earlier claims made here and in the original 2019 article from former Black Student Association president, who says, I believe that the administration at Jewel was more focused on upholding reputation and tradition 
which unfortunately meant many times ignoring the desperate cries of their own students. Although the IDI is discussed as a measure of improving DEI work on campus, we must be careful to regard the results of the inventory as representative or indicative of an issue and not a programmatic strategy to resolve issues of racial and cultural competency on campus. Now I want to bring us to another key identifier on the issues, of, uh, on the issues that mired DEI work at Jewel. This piece of information was present at the point in time in which the 2019 article was published, though it was not included at that time at the request of the then employee in the, uh, at the institution who submitted this memo to us. On January 2017, 2016, uh, David Salih received an email from Molly Fleming, a community organizer who had been contracted by Jewel to observe, engage, and directly train members of the William Jewell College community regarding race, racism, and inclusion on campus and in the classroom. She compiles a list of common concerns and, follow, and follows that with a series of priority recommendations. I want to draw our attention to a few key areas of concern she identifies. Beyond explicit individual racism, she goes on to say most white students that she interviewed reported observing or engaging in explicitly racist conversations in white-only company. The majority of these students reported the explicit racism as joking, though often uncomfortable. Few white students felt equipped or prepared to challenge these racist comments within their peer groups. About half expressed a desire to do so. I recite these comments not as an accusatory measure, but rather a sobering one, reflecting that in the not so distant past, the cancer of racism was present in the Jewel body. As it is always easier to bring history into clarity once we are physically beyond the actual event, we should take these comments and step with our current notion of community at Jewel today. She goes on to talk about tokenizing and universalizing the experiences of people of color, racial anxiety, and feigned and genuine ignorance to racial concerns, among other things. In, around, or near the moment in history where the motive to recover the history of slavery at Jewel prevails, we witness a collision with campus culture attuned to attitudes of minimization and avoidance. The quotes demonstrate a foundational cognitive belief in the continuity of a culture of violence. The importance of my study is to render discontinuous precisely this kind of violence that has haunted Jewel. We find these attitudes and themes tracked down lineages, defined by the founder's intent for a college that sits atop a hill. In light of this, I hesitate to simply forget about the things Ms. Fleming wrote, mostly because she points to a culture that harbors fear in the face of the unknown, fear about how radically changed might impact the jewel experience, fear about what others might think of you for asking us a, a certain question or thinking a certain thing. Now, my final argument. To chart a path forward perhaps requires that we first reflect on how historical trends within our own culture might impact the present day. For instance, the tendency towards minimization, avoidance, and poor organization perhaps accounts for the communicative disconnect between students, faculty, and staff. To achieve institutional coherence and harmony requires confrontation with the discourse of truth that unifies our organization. The Racial Reconciliation Commission report sets out to begin a discursive shift in the way that we think about the history of this place we stand at. It seeks to correct the course of local history that has too willingly replicated the mistakes of our national past. Dr. Stephen Harris, a member of the Slavery, Memory, and Justice Project, has written a wonderfully composed review of the RRC report. Should anyone want to read that, um, reach out to me or Dr. Wilkins if we can get it to you. I will echo some of the sentiments of Dr. Harris's analysis as well as extend some of my own. First, for the future of Jewel, we must engage the words historical and moral truth. These are the words that we are judging this entire academic excursion on, the ability to discern the historical and moral truth. The Dr. Jewel section of the report is focused on preserving those acts seen to be most honorable by the leader. Unfortunately, in doing this, the particular references that attempt to smooth the image of Dr. Jewell are taken out of context of pre-Civil War America. For instance, via the report, readers are left to determine Dr. Jewell's thinking about enslaved persons he owned, for example, by looking at his establishment of an American Colonization Society chapter. 
Dr. Harris astutely recognizes the historical uh, implications that give color to these particular instances, noting that a strong belief stood at the time about the uh, usefulness of slavery in caring for and ensuring the safety of the enslaved. Closely related to this line of argumentation were calls heard for further colonization in the form of the American Colonization Society. This group believed that African Americans had been civilized to a level from which they could now pull Africa out of the depths of barbarism. The societal resolution Dr. Jules sought was the perpetual continuation of an essentialized view of race that saw black and white as distinctly different and unable to coexist. This must be a notion related to the vision the namesake of this institution held, and thus related to the institution itself. What does it mean for us now to know that Dr. Jewell probably envisioned this hill as a safe haven for learning by white students? Secondly, we must mediate and meditate on the presence of the enslaved. The graveyard that sits at the heart of our campus is a Liberty, Missouri relic, yet it is not largely acknowledged that the unmarked graves of the enslaved rest on the north end of that cemetery. The presence of the enslaved remains muted, even as the RRC report attempts to revive the memory of the enslaved persons that contributed to the early construction and stability of the college. Perhaps it is a hyper-focus on the role enslavement plays in the history of the college that serves to distort the truth of enslavement at Jewel in some cases. The wording of the report implies moral reprehensibility through the moral perspective of a post-slavery society. This leaves a, a reader prone to foreclosing their interpretation to believe that slavery is bad, while not elucidating the lasting process of violence that slavery implies. More than an economic enterprise, enslavement befits an ideological enterprise that premises subjective destitution on the social unthought, the category of blackness. Finally, we must tune our discourse to the educational ends of an evolving and ostensibly white institution. We must ask ourselves how Alexander Donovan's political and educational ideas might contribute to his passion for riling up support for the college during the 1848 subscription campaign. And how might the educational circumstances here replicate the goals and beliefs of our founders? Namely, one of the educational circumstances instituted by the founders and lasting until today is the neglect of recording black history. Another is the existence of racist thoughts and actions occurring on campus. Yet another is a culture described as inaccessible by black students. The through line for all of this harkens back to our discussion of minimization. When we concede a culture that primarily tries to move beyond a problematic racialized history, we may hastily help erase the potential for paradigmatic change historical research should prompt us to make. It is mediation via embracing local narratives and ugly truths that is the goal of my arguments and the argument of the SMJP as a whole. When we continue to avoid ugly facts about the founding of this institution, we, per we persist in the same kinds of cultures that have historically existed here. When we put aside our hopes and assumptions, we can soberly rearrange the identity of the institution in equitable and inclusive ways. Thank you.